My name is Erica Borgers Klonkowski. Uh, I'm a biochemist, uh, PhD candidate, and I work at NSWC Dahlgren in Virginia. And I'm here to interview Lieutenant Commander Laura Moody today, if you would. Uh, how, how did you get into your STEM career? Describe your journey for me a little bit uh, as to how you, um, how you landed there. Of course. So probably like a lot of people, um, my journey started with some wonderful teachers in high school and even back to middle school. Um, I had um, two absolutely amazing um, chemistry and biology teachers um, who made a big difference in my life, obviously, as you can see. Um, and when I was um, thinking about what I might want to do for college and beyond high school, it was those two teachers and mentors um, who encouraged me to think about going into um, chemistry was a little bit more where my passion was um, and look at um, exploring ways to do that, right? Um, so they set me up with a high school counselor. Um, they set me up with like different schools um, that might be open and a possibility to me. And then one of them um, coincidentally had served in the military and um, thought about, said, hey, have you thought about using the military or even the government at large, right, to get into the STEM career fields? And in order to avoid uh, large bills, right, for education and avoid leaning too heavily on my parents, I decided to sign up for um, ROTC um, through my high school counselor. Um, I was not a uh, junior ROTC participant or in any way uh, had the military on my mind at all. Um, and, but it just somehow it fit, it worked out. Um, I was able to obtain an Air Force ROTC scholarship through um, Duke University and pursue my passion for chemistry while basically having everything paid for, right? Um, at a pretty good school. And um, after finishing up the four years there, I was a normal student, right? Um, except for once or twice a week participating in ROTC, but um, I was able to uh, join the Air Force, have a job right upon graduating, which is always a challenge, right? Um, in my uh, chosen career field, right? I went um, and became a, like a bench level chemist at the Air Force Research Laboratory, which was an absolutely awesome experience. Um, Very cool. I also, um, through the two wonderful high school teacher mentors that I had, I was able to participate in the National Junior Science and Humanities Symposium, a uh, DOD-sponsored uh, science fair, essentially, right, science competition for high school students. Um, that takes place, um, it rotates around to different cities in the US and each state sends one or two finalists um, depending on your state. And it's an opportunity for um, high school students to conduct original research that is either presented on a poster or in an oral presentation to a panel of um, like PhD level DOD scientists, right? Like the real deal um, and very, very experienced professionals and experienced successful scientists and get feedback on their work. Through that, I was able to further refine my interest in chemistry, um, earn a bit of a scholarship and uh, see kind of the breadth of what was offered in terms of STEM careers and the government, which was something that I had absolutely no idea existed. Um, just the variety of paths that people can take to get into STEM career fields and can, can take to you know pursue their passion there. Um, yeah, it's amazing how um, many more opportunities are available to high school and college students if they're not. It's absolutely, quiet. it's absolutely incredible. And I would encourage anyone to, um, it, it's hard to know what's out there, right? Until you, until you know what you know, um, but to lean on their resources, like counselors to lean on the resources that are around them. Um, because I think particularly, even though it was 20 plus years ago, I had absolutely no idea as a high school student that all of these things were available and that they were basically um, employers and organizations, um, research, private government, all of it out there looking for people who had the kinds of interests that I had. And that was, was pretty neat to make those connections. <laughs> Excellent. If you could um, just <laughs> highlight like some of the um, academic classes or academic paths you had to take to get into your area. 
Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I would definitely encourage even um, people who are in middle school, right? As soon as you're able to choose the classes that you enroll in to really seek out those math classes, those science classes. Um, I think now much more than when I was growing up, you even have specialized classes like robotics and all kinds of things like that, that are in some of the high schools. Um, but Having come from a much smaller high school myself that didn't have maybe the variety that some other high schools have, I would want to um, especially speak to students who may not be at those big centers and hubs, maybe near a university or even have a community college in your town, um, to take the basics, right? Like get your chemistry or biology, math, calculus, all of that down. And don't be discouraged by the fact that maybe um, there are schools or there are programs where students who are the same age or the same grade level might have access to more, right? It's about optimizing what's in front of you. And then knowing that if you have that foundation laid through like a, a solid um, science and math background in high school, and just a basic understanding of the scientific method and that that foundation laid inside of you, right? And that inquisitiveness and all of that and discipline um, that, that you are not at any kind of disadvantage um, because you didn't maybe have access to the variety of classes that everybody else did. So really briefly, you mentioned that you, you did Air Force ROTC, which I know is a lot more common in educational mm -hmm. establishments. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get to the Navy? So actually, um, when I was about halfway through my Air Force career, um, in the Air Force, I was a chemist, right? They have a specialty there where you are a chemist and you're doing mainly um, bench level chemistry. They, the Air Force experienced a downsizing about 10 years ago, and they gave me the option to either transfer into the Navy or transfer into the Army. Um, and I kind of saw the posters of Navy medicine and all the cool things that Navy medicine does, right? Um, and so I made a mid-career transition into the Navy, um, into the medical um, career field. Can you describe to us your, your S&T topic, what you do and how it's relevant to the Navy, um, kind of in terms of, you know, no experience of the military whatsoever, uh, if that makes sense? Sure. Sure. Um, so I have a little bit of a, a, a windy path, um, like a lot of people, right? Um, I am trained as a chemist. I came into the military as a chemist. When I transitioned into the Navy, I was assigned um, as a medical person. And what I do is a specialty called industrial hygiene or industrial health. And so what um, my day-to-day -day job is, is I'm going out to different work sites, different military operations, um, different things that we're doing in that environment. And I'm taking air samples, I'm taking bulk samples, um, I'm taking sometimes um, sound or noise samples, sometimes I'm taking radiation readings and so forth with the ultimate goal of preventing long-term illness, preventing injury. Um, so I work hand in hand with safety, but safety is kind of like what's in front of you right now, right? Industrial hygiene is more focused on long-term prevention of illness. So think about things, I mean, classic things you think about are asbestos exposures, lead exposures, any kind of um, environmental exposures like that that cause bad things in people right down the line. Um, so my job is focused on the prevention of that and the way, where I'm um, leveraging my chemistry background is we go out and we physically collect samples and we'll collect, you know, like a, a statistically significant number of samples to make an exposure assessment on whatever it is that we're concerned about exposing people to. Um, and the focus there is really on people, protecting people and making changes to either our processes, the way we design things, the way we design um, protective equipment and things like that to make sure that people are functioning at their optimal and are not developing illnesses um, in the course of the work that they're trying to do, which is sometimes kind of inherently hazardous, right? Based on what we do. So in the course of your day to day, are you able mm -hmm. to like make suggestions or, um, you know, find ways to improve the technologies that you have to use in your field um, and provide those to the Navy to make like the next gen even better than what it is currently? Yes, absolutely. Um, so a large part of what we do and where we might be employed as industrial hygienists is looking at analytical equipment, looking at detection techniques, looking at how we characterize things in the field. That process, um, as you know, in the government is like an iterative process, right? Um, for it's informed by the end user, sometimes 
projects that might be like real time monitoring equipment in the field, right? That's kind of, um, I don't know how to say it right, but like dummy proof, right? Like you can hand it to the <laughs> operator and they can take direct readings while they're actually downrange doing whatever it is they're doing where maybe like, I don't need to be next to them, right? Um, but we're still gathering that data. So I think that it very much is a process where we're able to inform the design of the next generation of equipment, where we're able to provide feedback. Um, and a lot of the um, instrumentation, even industrial hygiene that is used out um, even in the private sector might have been developed by a need that was identified in the government, right? Um, the government is sometimes um, in situations that are more hazardous um, than you might find in the private sector. So that need for, um, for things that are or equipment that's fortified, that's protected, that's um, remotely operated and so forth is, is pretty high, right? How would you say, or why would you say that your field um, mm -hmm. matters to the upcoming uh, high school students or college students? So I would say that um, this will probably sound canned, right? But I think that <laughs> no matter what the field is, right? No matter what the field is, I think that we can all agree that our most precious an irreplaceable and arguably expensive asset, right, is our people. Um, so protecting those people, no matter the environment, is the way that you're going to get anything done. I don't care if you're working in nanotechnology where they don't know yet necessarily all of the hazards of breathing that in, for example, right? Um, all the time, laws are changing, the science is changing, all of that. Um, so keeping the people safe who are working in all of these emerging fields is fundamental to the advancement of any field, right? What's the most unique or incredible experience that you've had in, in your career? So something that stands out, a couple of things. So um, something that stands out to me, um, I guess two things. So one of them is just strictly a military experience that I, I never thought I would have. I'm not maybe your typical military person, right? Like, especially graduating high school, it wasn't really in my wheelhouse at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I was able as an industrial hygienist to get stationed on an aircraft carrier, nuclear powered aircraft carrier, um, learn how to basically drive the ship, right? And drive the ship into a harbor in Japan like up there, like you see in the movies, that's pretty cool, right? Um, and even though, yes, I'm a chemist, I'm an industrial hygienist, that's my, that's what I'm trained to do. I was integrated completely into this team of people who were operating in the environment like that, completely outside my field, but what a cool experience to like be on the coattails of that, right? Um, yeah. And learn about the intricacies of how all that works. I would, I would never have had the opportunity outside of the military to do that, right? Um, I and then- get that. Yes, yes. Um, in terms of um, like the science and stuff like that and, and, and neat things that I've been able to sort of be on the fringes on of um, are working. I worked at an agency called the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. That's the former Defense Nuclear Agency. Um, and to be able to be part of some of the testing that they're doing there. Um, obviously, all of it is like counter weapons of mass destruction testing at this point in our history. Um, but to be able to be around some of the legacy uh, testing and technology that has been developed by that agency and tested at some of the places that I was able to visit was just pretty cool. I mean, it's like the stuff of history books, right? Um, and to be able to be there as part of the teams that in inherited that is just like really exciting, right? So Yeah, that is very nice. So one other thing, if you could uh, offer like one or two bits of advice for mm -hmm. high school or college students, yes. um, what would you put forward for them? Um, so this one may not be very traditional, but I would say that leaving high school, if I could have maybe done something better, it would have been to identify a path, at least for like the next five to 10 years of why am I getting this degree and what do I want to do with it, right? Um, I think it's very important, you know, when you're 18 or 16 or whatever to have interests and passions and big dreams and stuff like that, right? Um, but I think it's equally important to um, sit down, have an honest conversation with yourself. Like this is an old fashioned word, but what vocation does this translate into? Right? Like what is the, what, if I'm going to go get a degree in basket weaving, whatever it happens to be, right. Whatever your passion is, how does that translate into 
what does my day-to-day life look like, right? What does my schooling look like and so forth? And take the time to sit down and think about that. And probably a lot of people are a lot better at that than I am, right? Um, but I found myself kind of drifting, like, okay, what works here? What works here? Um, and to have a little bit of at least a roadmap in your head, it's okay if you deviate from it, right? We all do. Um, but to have a little bit of a roadmap um, for where you want to get, and then at least that sets your baseline, right? And then when you deviate, you can say this feels wrong, this feels right, whatever. Um, but that would kind of be my thought there. Very nice. Um, well, ma'am, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, I have found what you do is fascinating. And like I said, it overlaps with a lot of what I've done in my career so far. So thank you very much for for talking about STEM, especially as a a female um, in the STEM career. I I know that that will be impactful for a lot of students that get to see this today. So thank you very much. Of course, thank you so much for having me.